Hey guys, thanks for stopping in. It is Thursday evening in December, December 20th, 2018. It's been quite a while since I've done a live video. I'm trying to use my Apple AirPods for this. Hopefully they connected properly. I was listening to, listening to music just a little while ago, but hopefully they're broadcasting as my mics. Hello, Todd May. Thanks for stopping in. Please leave a comment so I can make sure my comments are working. Facebook has changed the formatting a little bit since the last time I did a Facebook Live. So a lot of stuff looks different. Um, comments. If Tom Crawford is here. Blade Tech in the house. Um, yeah, Todd May, a live broadcast. I'm not dead. We're still here. Still in business. Still making stuff. Hey, Mike Hallam. Hello, Jeremy Ratzlaff. Hey, Kyle Shook. How's Shook's Customs doing all about that CZ life, huh? So, it's been a long time since I've done a Facebook live feed, and a lot has changed here in the shop, but a lot has stayed the same. And I wanted to quickly go over a tool tip, because I used to do that at the beginning of each of my broadcasts. Good evening, Troy. Hi, Chris Comsa. Um, these are a pair of flush trim nips. I use these a lot on Kydex, on fasteners, on little tail ends, on stuff I'm machining. All kinds of different stuff. Um, these ones are by Excelite. I really like them. Um, this style of nips where you have a flush nip that's ground on one face, super useful. Oftentimes I can clip corners and make small adjustments to Kydex with it easily and then take it right to a sander and not mess around with grabbing a bandsaw or anything else. Hello, Marco. Um, hello, Marco Lancaster. I saw you sneak in there. Uh, so what has changed? I hired my second full-time employee uh, fairly recently, which has been excellent because it means that I'm able to have one person forming, pre-cutting, another person feeding the CNC machines. Uh, and then when we go to days of assembly, I have one person buffing and folding and one person assembling, bagging and labeling. And so the throughput from the shop has really picked up. Having a second full-time employee in addition to myself and my guy, Eric, who's been with me for a couple of years now, um, has been a big difference. So if you've, if you've thought about scaling your business and you've been trying to do it without hiring, I remember there being a discussion a while ago on one of the Facebook groups about how to scale a business. And I'm actually going to step over and turn off those lights behind me. One second. There we go, that's better. Hello, Nate Perry. And so the question of how to scale your company is some guys are using trying to use automation, some are outsourcing, some are um, hiring. I've done a mix of both. I don't do a lot of outsourcing, although there are certain key things that are not my core competency where it made tons of sense. Like um, I don't do any injection molding. I don't make injection molds. I don't have an injection molding machine. That's not an industry that I think I would be incapable of learning how to do at a basic level for the simple parts that I need to make, but it's not my core competency. And so rather than uh, rather than beat myself up to try to learn that right now, I just outsource it to people who know how to do it. Thanks, Nate Perry. I'm glad you like him. Thanks for watching. So the topic for tonight is what about passion? Because I've been reading... So a year ago, I was on a big Gary Vaynerchuk kick, and I still like Gary V. I still listen to his stuff. I've not spent as much time doing uh, podcast listening in this past year. One of the major changes for me in 2018 was I finally started doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And that has been super fun, but that has been a significant time commitment for me that has come at the cost of some of the other things I used to do for fun or leisure. And I wouldn't change a thing. I love it. I've managed to so far avoid any serious injuries, you know, the usual sore joints and lots of bruises, but been having a good time doing that. And um, the passion that I see entrepreneurs talking about, I think is a double-edged sword. And I was thinking about this recently. I was laying in bed thinking about holsters, which if you're a holster maker, I'm sure you've done. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. I was having one of those evenings where I was chewing on a particular problem. I was trying to solve a design issue. I was trying to find a more efficient way to make a thing. Hello, Greg Swanson. Thanks for stopping in. I was trying to find a way to make a specific thing work better, faster, be more manufacturable with a lower loss rate. And hey, Skip. And I was just laying in bed awake thinking about it. And 
If you asked me, Andrew, are you passionate about holsters? The answer would be yes and no, because holsters as an item, as an object, as a piece of craft or art or a piece of manufacturing are not especially exciting, honestly, in most cases. Certainly there is beauty to elegance and there is a certain attractiveness to simplicity. Hey, Vic Patton. Hi, Conrad. But in terms of what these objects do, what holsters are made to do, the job is fairly simple and straightforward. Hey, John Hopman. And the tools we have at our disposal um, are conventional. There's not a lot really new, hey, Cook, going on in the holster world in terms of guys finding unheard of ways to do things. Conrad, it's been a while since you tuned in because it's been a while since I've broadcast. And so, like, we're not, we're not inventing new technologies. Most of the elegance and most of the improvements that I've made in my shop and my process simply come from taking the time to read and listen and better understand the way other industries use tooling and processes that I can adapt and bring into my shop and put to work on my products. And that is a different kind of discovery. I'm not making things up out of whole cloth. I'm looking around at what other shops, other industries are doing and recognizing how the component parts work, how the equipment functions, what the trade-offs are in the way that they're manufacturing something. And then that's a big part of me deciding what trade-offs I'm willing to accept to make the things that I want to make. And so, Passion, hey Dave Baker, passion I think is overrated for entrepreneurs in the sense that I'm not convinced you have to love the thing you make in order to love making it. I think those are two separate things and as an entrepreneur, I'm very much more in the I love making it category than in the I love the thing for its own sake. And that means that that has... That, Everything's a trade-off. The trade-off there is I would be equally happy making something else, I think. I know I make holsters currently, but if I had to make auto parts or they call that benchmarking. Yeah, they do, Brent Fernandez. I, I get a Sharpie. I call this benchmarking. I just grab this and start writing on stuff. I only mark other people's benches, not my own. But I'm not especially passionate about holsters as a product. I believe in self-defense and self-reliance. I support the Second Amendment. I believe in our constitutional right to carry firearms. I am a very vocal proponent of having skills, having tools, being able to protect yourself and people you love. But as a thing, as an object, a holster is not especially exciting to me. And for that reason, I find myself having to take time periodically and just go look at other things in order to maintain the interest that I have in making. But I wouldn't call myself a maker. Hey Shane, it has been too long. Sorry man, I'm back for now. Probably be gone again for a while, we'll see. But um, I, bought an, uh, I bought a volume, an episode, uh, yeah a volume, it's a print magazine, of Make Magazine this past week. And a few years ago, I had looked around at local hacker spaces, maker spaces, because I'm in a big town, college town, and there was a hacker space, a maker space, um, that I could go check out. And they had a, a laser cutter, they had some manual milling, they had welding, um, they had 3D printing, they had a handful of other things. And what I found there was a community that I really felt I didn't fit into. And it wasn't because... It wasn't because I wasn't interested in the things that they were doing, but I gave up on being a hobbyist a long time ago. And what I mean by that is I don't really have hobbies. I love to read. I play music. I don't have hobbies anymore. And... That means that the things that I do, I do all in. Like, if I'm making stuff, I'm making stuff. If I'm doing jujitsu, I'm doing jujitsu. If I am 
learning to do some other thing I want to learn. I really want to go all in. And so a local makerspace where a lot of different people were sort of dabbling in a little bit of 3D printing, a little bit of laser cutting, a little bit of screen printing, a little bit of welding, a little bit of manual machining, a little bit of whatever and everything was a space that I really felt I didn't fit in, which was odd. Hi, Mark Lewis. Thank you for that delicious bottle of Los Osanos. It's, uh, Los Osanos. I think I got pronounced that correctly. Tasty. Um, and so I have to pursue the things that I have passion for in a sense, but the passion is not about the objects. And so what I'm challenging myself for in 2019 is to really dig into the things that do get me excited in my business because as I hire more people, as I delegate more of the operations, as I delegate more of the production of my shop, it would be very easy for me to end up holding bits and pieces in my hands and not really fencing off an area for myself to do the things that I need to do and that I want to do in my business. And I'm a big believer in, this is one thing I, I agree entirely with Gary Vee on, that I believe you should double down or triple down on the things that you're strong at. If you are bad with numbers and you and spreadsheets are death for you like they are for me, you should not be your own bookkeeper. You should not be your own accountant. You should find competent people and you should pay them well because they'll do it so much faster and better than you will that the money you save by doing it yourself is not remotely worth the hassle or the stress. My wife is watching. <laughs> and so I believe that you do need to double down on the things that you're strong at and that you will see more upside in your business by investing in the things that you have the most ability to invest in, the most ability to leverage those skills, those interests, those personality traits, those styles of learning, those particular aptitudes, those people skills, those creative ideas, whatever it is you have. Go all in on those because that's where you're going to actually be able to build the strongest, most robust part of your business. The flip side of that though is you can delegate almost anything and you have to be able to hold on to some things that are not entirely draining. If I only did the work that I can't delegate currently, I would hate coming into my shop because there are certain jobs that I could delegate, but I love doing them. They satisfy me. They interest me. They're a way for me to be tangibly in touch with improvements and, and developments and growth that I've made in my business. And that's important to me. I don't want to just say, okay, I checked that box. So I fixed that thing. I can hand it off now and I never have to touch it again because that doesn't, it doesn't feed me in my business. And passion is not uh, an eternal flame. Burnout in small business owners is a real thing. And I'm sure that many of you guys, if you're holster makers, you've run into this where you've got orders, they've come in, and some night you end up grinding it out at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and you finish up and you dust the Kydex dust off, and you're thinking... Am I crazy? What am I doing? Why am I doing this? So yeah, Conrad, passions are fleeting. And this is not to say passion doesn't have value because the times when I find something that fascinates me and I really want to dig into it and I want to read about it and I want to talk to people who understand it and I want to listen to podcasts about it and watch YouTube videos about it, I really want to get into it. That level of interest and passion is a useful tool. Hi, Nick Hoffer. And... You need to be able to use that, but it alone isn't enough. If that's all that's in the tank, you won't make it up the hill. You won't make it over the mountain. And so finding a strategy that makes sense for me and delegating the things that I need somebody else to be doing and then picking and choosing as I go, sent you some samples today. Love it, Nick. Thank you. I look forward to seeing them. Picking and choosing among the things that remain so that you keep some things that still help spool you up, still help get you excited. I love running CNC machines. CNC machines have fascinated me since I was in high school. And it took a long time for me to finally get my hands on one and finally start learning how to use them. 
And I love it. I really enjoy programming. I love standing at the machine and watching the machine make parts. But standing at the machine and watching the machine make parts is not an effective way to use my time. Hello, Nathan. Thank you for watching from Texas. However, does that mean that I should never stand in front of my machine and watch it? Should I always be cracking the whip on myself and saying, you need to do something more important. You need to do something more productive. You can't stand in front of this machine. That's work for an employee. No, I have to be able to do that. I have to be able to give myself a mixed diet of high level creative stuff, strategic organizational stuff, business planning stuff, administrative management stuff, hands-on quality control, making stuff, prototyping. And then sometimes I just need to sit down and feed the machine for a while. And that's totally fine. I, it's easy if you get yourself in a hole, if you overcommit to projects, if your backlog piles up, to feel this frantic sense of, I have to be doing the most urgent thing now. I have to be doing the most urgent thing now. I have to be doing the most urgent thing now. And I've been on and off that hamster wheel for years, and it's miserable. And so I know I've said this many times before. When I'm in my shop and I need to reset, my favorite thing to do is get a broom. I love to just pick up a broom and take 15 minutes and just sweep. Get under tables, around the CNC machines, move things off the wall, really sweep. Not just a, here's the main thoroughfare of the shop and there's some chips, so we'll sweep those up and call it good. But actually dig into the nooks and crannies around the shop and clean the place, improve the place. That's really refreshing to me. I come away from that more energized, more able to work, more able to think than I was when I started. Um... I found my time at jujitsu each week to be enormously helpful for that as well. Because I can honestly say when I get on the mats and I'm rolling, I don't think about holsters a single time. It's when I'm, when I'm that engaged in what I'm doing, I'm able to turn that switch a hundred percent the other way. And I'm not thinking about machining. I'm not thinking about invoices. I'm not thinking about emails. I'm not thinking about ordering. I'm not thinking about my vendors. I'm not thinking about customers. I'm not thinking about repairs or warranties. I'm not thinking about CAT or CAMP or CNCs. I'm just out there and I'm thinking about lapels and sleeve grips. I love that. I need that. Dan Boyle, sometimes mindless work is the most productive. It's amazing because there have been many times when I have tried to lock myself in and focus on some high level, challenging, creative, problem solving thing, and it just wasn't gonna go. The wheels were just spinning. And I can spend an hour or two doing that and then call it off and walk away from that realizing I would have been better off to just get a duster out and clean off the tops of my machines. I would have been better served for that two hours to just get a shop vac and clean, to just restock hardware bins or prep a bunch of holster packaging, pre-cut a bunch of material. Thanks, Anthony Fitch. I appreciate you watching. And so have that gear. Be able to shift. Like, if it's not working, don't grind on it. And, and that's contrary to some of the, you got to put your head down, hard charging. I've become much more suspicious of a lot of the entrepreneur-ish stuff that I see on social media, especially. If you've noticed, I've scaled back my social a lot. I'm not posting on Instagram as much. I'm not commenting. I'm, I'm just not doing that right now. And that's a season. I expect to come back to it. But it's a season that I need to go through because... There isn't enough time in my, there isn't enough time and energy in my life to do all that. And I'm married, I've got four young kids, and I've got life happening. And many of the business oriented podcasts and things that I used to try to pay attention to, the content that I used to try to follow up on, it's just not as applicable to me. 
Tom, that's not what I mean. Everything on Instagram is true, except for Fit T. As far as I know. That's what I've heard. But the guys who I still pay attention to on social, the stuff that I look for, um, are not the guys who are like 24-7 grinding. So I, 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 I discovered that there's an equivalent to this in the, in the jiu-jitsu world. Um, it's the phrase everyday parada, which means like all hard rolling all the time. And that's just, hey, if you want an everyday parada, you go for it. I don't grind that well anymore. I can put my head down and I can charge through a big project with the best of them. I'm confident in my ability to clear away the distractions, hone in on something and work and work and work. But yeah, the, the outside commitment of a couple days a week, knowing that at a certain time I knock off, I shut the machines down, I lock the shop up and I drive to the gym and get the life choked out of me by people, um, half my size sometimes. <laughs> it's pretty fun. Um, that's been a useful discipline for me and a really helpful way of just pressing the refresh button on my day. I come back from rolling energized. Even if I have terrible rolls, which I often do because I'm a no-stripe white belt who barely knows the difference between an arm and a leg. Hey, Jeff Kwan. But I find that time really useful for myself. It helps me. And so passion is a thing that I have to, I have to do maintenance on it. I have to do preventative maintenance on it. It's not enough to simply follow my interests around the shop from day to day because that will mean that the hard things that need to get done won't get done, like taxes, that kind of stuff. You know, Those things, you just have to grind through. There's, there's no escaping some percentage of work in the shop being painful or unpleasant and you just need to be the one who grinds through it. The buck stops with you. You're the business owner. It's got to get done. It's on you. But on the flip side, I can't spend all my time only grinding through the things that I hate to do. Otherwise, I'll just close up shop. There's no reason for me to do it if everything that I have to do is all stuff that I don't want to do. And so finding a balanced diet of challenges, grunt work, excuse me, Administrative stuff that just has to get done. And then work that I find really rewarding or exciting. Finding a mix, a balance of all those things that works well to keep me energized and excited to come into the shop. That's really important. And I have on days and off days. I'm sure you guys do too. There are some days when I can't get that mix right for the life of me. Mick Williams just showed up. I start talking about jujitsu, and as soon as I'm done, my coach shows up. Hey, Mick, it's a uh, it's a Thursday evening. I stayed home from the gym tonight because I'm kind of sniffly, but hopefully I'll be feeling better tomorrow and come in and get a couple of uh, struggle cuddles in on the mat. We ran a whole bunch of those uh, IWB mag carriers you like this week, and I've got extras, so talk to me about that. I've got a Menards bag for you. Um, and I'm a competitive person in business, but not in the sense that I don't, I'm not really on the Ray Kroc, you know, put a hose in their mouth, drown the competition thing. I don't, I don't enjoy watching other companies go down in flames unless they really have doused themselves in gasoline by being enormous tools and then happen to run into a spark somewhere and burn to the ground. Um, 2018 has been an eye-opening year. I've had some... Nate Perry, Menards is the bomb. Um, I've had some eye-opening business interactions this year. I have had some of the harshest words by phone that I've ever had with anybody this year. I hope to not have to do that in 2019. Um, you know, when you're a business owner... You got your big boy pants on. If you say you're going to do something and I pay you to do something and you don't do it, I'm going to drop the hammer on you because you paid 
got paid to do it. You need to do it. No excuses. Get it done. You keep avoiding the sparks. But I'm not an especially competitive person. And this past weekend, I decided just to go for it and just go to a jiu-jitsu tournament. And I literally put it off until like 10 o'clock at night, the night before the tournament. I, I registered online. It's like, yep, I guess I'll sign up. White belt category, lightweight. Yep, sign me up. And it was really fun. It was stressful. There was a lot of waiting. But I have not played any competitive sports since high school. And, you know, aside from music competitions or auditions for jobs in college or after college, which are competitive but not in the same way, um, I hadn't done anything physically competitive in a long time. And it was really fun. I enjoyed it. And that, you know, I, I took Saturday off from the shop and went to a jiu-jitsu tournament and had a great time. A bunch of guys from my gym were there and girls from my gym. Way to go, Chelsea and Jordan. And we had a lot of fun. And so finding those things and finding a mix of what, you know, burns me down, tires me out, but also peps me up, gets me excited. Yeah, Dave Baker, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has been so fun. I love it. I'm finally to the point where I'm still able to walk after two hours on the mats. The first, the first two months, it was terrible. Terrible. I was so sore all the time. Um, and so in 2019, the things that I'm working on, hey, Tony Katner, the things that I'm working on in 2019 are rearranging my shop workflow to make it work effectively for a three to four person shop because I'm no longer a one man show. We're no longer a two man show. Rearranging, got to those, do those things that fire you, bro. Yeah, Mick, I agree. I had been kind of out of the loop on things that fired me up for the past couple of years. And I'm really glad that I finally got over the hump and started coming to the gym. Um, rearranging the shop workflow to be good for three, good for four people. Um, 2019, I'm going to be getting, in, getting into 3D printing finally in my shop because there are a lot of little jigs, fixtures, things that I want to make that are not cost effective or easy to fixture on a CNC machine. And as a way of trying out some new hardware ideas that I've got, um, just as a general purpose around the shop helper maker thing, a 3D printer is what I'm looking at for 2019. So I hope to have that on the floor in about two weeks. And that's going to be a fun learning curve. Be reading some articles, watched a bunch of YouTube and working on organization. I'm now to the point where I've outgrown my CNC tool store, so I need to either buy or make more racks. I need to get some new storage for all my end mills because I've got more than can fit in my current bin system. And there's a lot of things that have, we've finally filled up. Uh, I'm looking at a Raise 3D, a Raise 3D Pro 2, Tom. I'll send you a link. Um, dual extrusion up to 300C, fully enclosed because I keep my shop fairly cool. So I wanted something that could contain its own heat and keep the, the print bed pretty warm. But I've moved largely away from a lot of custom mold work. I'm not doing very much. I'm not really taking on hardly any new mold projects anymore. And obviously my existing clients, I'm still doing their stuff. Looking at you, Tom. And really focusing on tooling up and speeding up the OEM production side of my shop. And that's what the employees are really, really helpful for because once we get a process dialed in to make a certain kind of part and we've got our material prep and we've got our temperature and our time and our form process and our pre-cutting and our machining with all the fixtures and the programs and our QC and all that's done, then those are the kind of things that as a creative problem solving kind of person, I love making that process. I don't love running the 1234th piece through that process. But if you have a couple employees and you can rotate them through the CNC so that no one person is standing there for nine hours, just ding, fries are done, ding, fries are done, doing that thing, then it's manageable for everybody. And the end result is we churn out a whole bunch of parts to a really, really high quality standard. And I can largely spend my day programming, prototyping new things, working on organizational stuff, 
figuring out new ways or going out and tracking down new vendors for things. I can do the things that allow that are working on my business, not working in my business. Um, I think I've recommended before the book, The E-Myth, or the audio book, as I listen to, The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. He seems like a little bit of a weird dude, but the, the e-book, The E-Myth, the audio book, is worth listening to. The book's worth reading. And he breaks down business owners into three types, entrepreneurs, technicians, and managers. And he says, generally, most people who are business owners are technicians. They worked for somebody else doing technical work and decided to then go off on their own because they thought that they could do a better job of running the business than their boss could. And that there's a fundamental misconception about that because doing technical work is not the same as running or managing a business that does technical work. And most people, Gerber thinks, and I agree with him, most people are not primarily entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are not that common. And when you talk about people who are really far at the entrepreneur end, they're exceedingly uncommon. Most people have little entrepreneurial fits and starts and occasional light bulb moments of entrepreneurial angst. But most people are a combination of a manager and a technician. I am more a technician than a manager, although I have decent managerial skills. If I was suddenly dropped into a 50-person business and I had to manage it, I would be overwhelmed. But I never had to do that job that way. So of course I'd be overwhelmed. Would I be able to learn it and do it? Probably. But finding ways to divest myself of the technical work and train my employees to do that technical work uh, is going to be a major part of me growing the company to where it needs to be a year from now. So spending time training my employees on CAD and CAM so I can give them more basic stuff and we can actually template out a workflow for forming molds, trimming molds, making fixtures, doing all the stuff that I currently do so that my employees can do that and I don't need to be the one always doing that machining, always doing that camming. That would be huge. Um, as we've upped our volume of throughput of parts, I had to change how I do packing slips, had to change how I do shipping labels. We've had to reorganize our shipping area. Um, I really need to, I'm looking at getting a tablet for the shop because I really want my employees to be able to scan things in and print a packing slip. Like, you know, we're, we're packaging things that are barcoded. This thing, blip, 25 of those, enter, add to packing slip. This thing, scan, blip, 48 of those, add to packing slip, print. I want, you know, as long as we've got barcodes on the product packages, let's be able to scan them and be able to track the inventory that way. And so moving to a more integrated system for managing my raw materials, for managing my hardware, for managing machine time, for managing packaging, for handling shipping, all that stuff, I'm going to be chewing on that. I don't think I'm quite ready for ERP software yet, but I've been looking at it a little bit and I need to spend some more time on it because that's at least the trajectory I'm headed on. And the kinds of things that some friends of mine who own their own shops have done with ERP software that's just mind-bogglingly, beautifully, creatively, genius, efficient, and problem-solving, and lean, is wonderful. And so I want to make smart investments in whatever tech I need. Scanners, tablets, more wireless printers, you know, a big screen for the wall so we can keep an ongoing running tally digitally of the work that's coming up. Whatever. We currently use whiteboards and, and uh, cork boards. Whatever I need to do to make the business more agile so we can more effectively track what's going on and keep up with it, it's going to be a lot of that in 2019 because I would love to be doing a Facebook Live broadcast a year from now and have five or six employees. I don't even know if I'll be in this workspace a year from now if I've got six employees. Who knows? Um, as the business grows, inevitably we're going to need to move. I'm not sure exactly where to or how much space I'll need, but we'll figure that out as we go. And there's no question that the space that I currently have could be more effectively utilized. ERP is amazing. I built a few in past companies. Yeah, the, the kinds of things I've seen other machine shops do with their ERP software is pretty mind-boggling. And I want a piece of that. So... 
For me, what about passion comes down to managing the things that I do in the business so that I have a mixed a mixed workload of things that drain me and things that charge me up. Otherwise, I would be all drained all the time. And as a business owner, if I'm drained and everything is just grinding metal on metal out here, the business doesn't do well. Move to Connersville, of course. Have you looked at Teamwork Software? Um, I'm aware of a few out there like Asana. I've used Trello a bit. Um, it's not terrible. It doesn't do everything that I want. And there's a lot of stuff still that I need to figure out. Some things you do by fi finding a solution that already exists and adapting your workflow to work with the solution you found. And other things are more effectively done by deciding upfront how you want it to work and then going out and finding a solution that does that. Hello, Caleb Starr. Thanks for watching. I definitely don't have a passion for holsters. It's for the business, says Nick Hoffer. And I think being honest with yourself about that is really important. Two years ago, I remember there being a lot more grinding in the holster community between guys who were looking at scaling, looking at CNC, were going in on vacuum forming, were buying machined molds, and guys who were still on the every single one handmade, every one a unique snowflake, I'm not a business, I'm a craftsman thing. And I am a craftsman. But this is a business. And so that means that I'm willing to do things in a business-like way, not primarily in a craftsman-like way. Hello, Robert. No. How's Illinois? And that means that sometimes I have to be willing to accept a lower quality standard than I would if I were a craftsman. If I were operating my business as a craftsman. If I were charging... If I, were use, if I were charging tons of money per holster, and I'm a pretty median in terms of pricing, like most of my stuff's in the $75 to $85 range, which when you're talking about appendix light-bearing holsters is fairly average, maybe slightly above average, but you know, I'm not Griffin Industries. We're not charging $145 for a light-bearing holster. Although maybe, maybe we could, maybe we should. Maybe in 2019, 60% price increases across the board on everything. Get your Swift Presses now, guys. By the way, Swift Presses are in stock. Turbo Props are in stock. Turbo Drops are in stock. And I'm closing out Morpheus Duo Cigar Trays. Morpheus Singles are all gone. Morpheus Duos, I still have like seven or eight left, I think. And I'm blowing those out for 45 bucks shipped. So if you like cigars or know somebody who likes cigars or need to buy a Christmas present for somebody who likes cigars, go to my website, Buy a Morpheus Duo Tray for 45 bucks shipped. That's a crazy deal considering the amount of machining that goes into those. Craftsmen need to become knife makers. Knife makers need to become businessmen, Mark Lewis. I'm amazed, especially in the, in the knife making world often, by the things that I see that, unless I'm just terrible at math, things just don't make sense often. What can I say? And so... Being honest with myself about what I am and am not passionate about. I don't need to be passionate about everything that my business does. Um, I, I recently read the uh, reading Zappos, Delivering Happiness. And I believe in company culture and I want to keep my employees and my customers happy. Oh man, knife makers, says Kyle Shook. Seriously. When holster makers go, oh, I don't know how he's charging that much and still making any money. Seems like just a, just a, an exercise in futility. And everybody else is looking at holster makers going, I don't understand how these guys are charging this for the item. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, we've all got our pecking order. Holster makers look down at knife makers for being impractical and not business minded. And knife makers, I don't know. Who do knife makers look down at? Got me. Um... So be honest with yourself about what you are passionate about. Chris Johnson, thanks for stopping in. Are you passionate about machining? Are you passionate about holsters? I want free trade handcrafted artisan holsters. Mick, I will free trade handcraft an artisan holster for you. It'll be $275. It will be made out of uh, gluten-free Kydex. Uh, and I will lubricate and uh, 
rust proof all the hardware with pure trans fat or pure non-trans fat, depending on how you're, how you swing on that. Chris, I haven't done one of these in forever. It's been a long time. So if I say to myself, these are things my business does that I'm not passionate about, that's fine. And it's helpful. <laughs> Knife makers look down on BJJ gym owners. BJJ gym owners look down on Taekwondo gym owners. Has to be organic. Organic free range holsters. Yes, ethically sourced. Um, humanely dispatched. Like we play, we play, you guys have seen Soylent Green? If you haven't seen Soylent Green, see Soylent Green. Um, we play beautiful classical music while we cut the kydex into pieces and then put it in the mill. Um, but being free to say, these are things my business does that I'm just not passionate about, but they need to happen because the business is an organism in order to work. It has to have all these parts. You can't have half an engine that functions. And so looking at all those things and saying, this is what we do. This is what I love. I'm going to do some of both and I'm going to find ways to delegate the things that just drain me because I won't be able to sustain it otherwise. That's not a betrayal of my business. It's not a betrayal of my customers. It's not a betrayal of any artistic vision. It's just being real about what I am, what I do and don't like, what I can and can't do well. I just got a notification that Jeff Kwan ordered something. Our ordering system is experiencing a sudden glitch. Jeff Kwan's order will not be able to be completed. Who knows? We'll see. I wonder what it was. I hope you ordered an astonishing quantity of stuff. Um, but anyway, I'm going to go ahead and pack it up for the night, guys. I got a little bit more machining to do. And tomorrow is my last day with my employees here before Christmas break. They've got next week off, which means I will be going hog wild in the shop, reorganizing, cleaning up, throwing things away, putting stuff on shelves. Usually, Indiana has kind of a weird transition fall to winter. And so a lot of stuff that was summer-oriented, fans and other th things that are out in the shop, get kind of shoved to the walls, but not really stashed for the winter. And so I will definitely be going through the shop while my employees are off next week and buttoning down the hatches to make sure that this place is organized for winter. Thank you, David Baker, and a Merry Christmas. I'll send an email in five minutes about an order status update. Let me hit my big red refund button. SHOT Show, yes, Nick Hoffer. Um, so if you're going to SHOT Show, the place a lot of guys meet up is uh, in the Venetian at what they call the Circle Bar, which actually has a different name. It's not really the Circle Bar, but if you're there, you'll know what it is, Circle Bar. Um, looks like Jeff Kwan just bought him a Morpheus tray. Uh, I will send you a text. I've got one blue anodized one left, Jeff, and you can have it if you want it. Merry Christmas, Kyle. Merry Christmas, Brent. Um... I will be at SHOT Show Monday through Friday, and so we should definitely uh, have some holster maker meetups. I know that uh, Holster Builder is having a meetup. The Bellini Bar, Brent Fernandez, that was the name. Uh, holster Builder is having a meetup, uh, I think, Tuesday and Wednesday night. I'm not sure the location yet. All right, Jeff Kwan, you got it. One blue one coming up. Um, holster Builder is having a meetup, and... I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it to that. I'm, I know I can't go Tuesday. I've got something in the evening, but I might be there Wednesday. But um, Nick Hoffer, I nominate you to organize a holster maker meetup um, either Monday or Thursday of SHOT Show so that both the early guys and the late guys who are there at the beginning of the end of the week have something to do, someplace to meet up. I'm going to be spending probably less time on the show floor this year than last year. Because I have more meetings to do and more, you know, more things that don't involve just walking around and looking at what Keltec is releasing this year. Can't wait to stroll around again this year. Full concealment holster. Monday is best for you, says Nick Hoffer. All right, Nick, I will be getting in like 8 a.m. Monday. I'll be there all day. So let's figure that out and have a meetup. Definitely should do it. So. DM me, guys, says Nick Hoffer. Get it together, says Jeff Kwan. All right, I'm going to hop off here. 
and get back to work. Thank you guys so much for stopping in and watching. I appreciate you taking the time to pay attention and come on over, even though it's been a super long time since I've done one of these. If there are any topics that you want me to cover in future ones, I'm going to try to, I've said this before, but still going to try to. Hey, Jim Cunningham, you got in just at the end as I'm getting ready to sign off. I'm going to try to do a few more of these. We're probably not going to ever be back on the two-a-week schedule that I was on a year and a half ago. But if there's anything in particular you want me to cover or you have questions about or ideas that would be fruitful for the discussion, let me know. We need to steal the Russian dude's vodka. Yes, the Russian dude you mean. Uh, pretty sure that's Spetsgear. And yeah, dude totally had bottles of vodka under the pile of gear in the milk crates at the back of his booth last year. Totally did. Props, man. Russians. Crazy. All right. I'm going to head out. Have a great night, guys. Thanks for stopping in. And have a very Merry Christmas.